The Break Free Party is a minor political party to which it describes itself as a new home for those determined to disrupt the failed status quo and build an alternative, a society that it uses as considerable wealth to provide dignity, security and justice for all. It's a youth-led movement which registered with the Electoral Commission in January 2021. On the 16th of August, Samantha Cooper, a Labour town councillor on the Keighley Town Council, defected to the Breakthrough Party, becoming the first Breakthrough Councillor and elected representative. On the 12th of November, it was announced that a second Labour Town Councillor had defected to the Breakthrough Party, Katie Parker of Murray Street Edmonds Town Council. Today, I'm joined with Joe Steeping. Thanks for coming on. Hi, thanks for having me, Curtis. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to jump straight in. Uh, for those that don't know who, who is watching right now, what is Breakthrough? Um, great. Well, thanks for, thanks for having me on, first of all. Um, as you say, Breakthrough is first and foremost a democratic socialist party. Um, we're grassroots and we're youth led. So we do have members of all ages in Breakthrough, but we felt like right from the outset, we wanted to have a sense of of definition of what, what we really wanted to talk about and focus on. And we felt like uh, a key issue that we can note within society was a really deep generational inequality. So there's a sense in which like the modern capitalist state, a kind of hyper-capitalist state, um, you know, a world, you know, a, a world of where we've had neoliberalism now for 40 years. I, I kind of sometimes think of it as like a ginormous kind of pyramid scheme. So if, you know, for people who, the generation is coming through the 60s and 70s and 80s, growing into adulthood, um, it's worth saying, by the way, you know, lots of people in those generations living in poverty, living in really difficult situations. We absolutely, you know, want, we want to get rid of that. We, we, we absolutely dedicate ourselves to a, to a you know, a, a wider social transformation. But we do think that there is a particular kind of, um, there are a particular set of issues affecting people who have come into adulthood in, in this millennium. So, you know, millennials, Gen Z, whatever labels you want to use. Um, these are a group of people for whom, um, eye-wateringly high rents and high property prices, um, insecure work and precarious work, low paid work, um, a cripplingly high student debt. Um, these are kind of like, there's a cocktail of factors that just mean that unless you've got really, really strong and, and let's face it, kind of wealthy social support networks, families and so on uh, to draw on, your life is way more difficult and the barriers facing you are just like fundamental just to be able to access like a basically secure job um uh, and a, and a, and a, a not unaffordable living uh, costs so that's that's our kind of core um message but but as i say we're a democratic socialist party and we we have a broader agenda um and that's really on our members and we, we're growing now pretty rapidly particularly in the as you say in the in the light of recent news um, we get lots of interest, lots of people currently in the Labour Party or, or people who've left the Labour Party coming to talk to us. And um, our, our kind of our message is we do we as, as democratic socialists, we believe in a transformation of the economy. We think it just fundamentally doesn't work for ordinary people. And however much we're kind of being constantly told within media and so on that actually everything's fine and there'll just be a few crises and then we're going to get through it we just think no this is this is a fundamental crisis ridden um method of social organization and we need to change it well what we had recently uh within the labor party was a slight emphasis excuse me emphasis on the young now under the new leadership, it looks like that young people are being neglected again. So I, I suppose that's a good political space breakthrough party can slip into, I suppose. Yeah. But we do have other smaller parties too. So like the yeah. Green Party, for example, what would you separate yourself from in terms of the Green Party, yeah. their policies and also how they govern right now or how their leadership style is right now? Yeah, I mean, so we get asked this a lot, as you can imagine. It's pretty, you know, when people ask us how you're different from the Labour Party, that's pretty easy. You know, I think, yeah. I think, you know, we we would say, I think it's worth just stressing this. We would say, you know, we don't see ourselves as continuity Corbynite, even. You know, we 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 definitely kind of, you know, for us that kind of um, more democratic, well, more social democratic, I would say, agenda of the Corbynite period is, was really welcome and and it galvanised lots of young people. But we we definitely have an agenda that goes beyond that. 
um, and it advocates for, for more radical transformation. And I, I would say that that does distinguish us from the Green Party. I think I'm not as, uh, some people are more disparaging about the Greens. I think there's like, there's absolutely space for a, for a, a um, you know, a party who, who make the issue of the environment a, a fundamental issue. I think obviously we all recognize the scale of the challenge we're facing. And we're talking like in the immediate aftermath of COP26, we can see how our leaders are kind of letting us down on that issue. But I think the big distinction I would make is that we believe that the only um, effective solution to the problem of climate change is um, genuine economic transformation and redistribution of wealth and redistribution of power um, so that our economy isn't organized for the interests of a wealthy few for whom kind of continue, continued consumption of our um, natural resources and exploitation of people in the global south um, is, is that's their profit margin. Like for us, we just don't think the kind of model of capitalism can continue if we genuinely want to address climate change. I think there are people within the Green Party who probably share that perspective, but I think like we are a genuinely anti-capitalist party. We're also committed um, to um, issues around, um, you know, tackling transphobia in society and other forms of discrimination. Again, I think within the Green Party, you've seen kind of internal issues around that. Um, we're absolutely unambiguous on those questions. I would like to hear your sort of analysis or the breakthroughs analysis on, on COP26, because it seems that it was a lot of media attention around it. There's definitely a, an awakening when it comes to climate change. But what I can see is a catalyst response to climate change. When you're seeing all these adverts from Amazon and saying, you know, do your bit, the greenwashing agenda. Then you had Jeff Bezos appear at COP26. What's your analysis and how do you feel that COP26 went? Yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a, a crisis, right? And, and nobody can pretend that it isn't a crisis anymore. So we, we, we can't even, you know, I think we're sort of starting to see this shift towards talking about climate breakdown, uh, to, talk, to actually getting real about the kind of the, the immediate effects, not just talking about this as something that's going to happen in 100 years. And I think that kind of, it's really powerful to have these conferences simply because you do have an opportunity for people who are at the sharp end of it to be put center stage. So I think, it, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, it was either the president or the prime minister of Barbados gave a really, really powerful address at COP26, just basically saying, this is happening right now. And the kind of mitigations that you're proposing, the support you're proposing for countries like mine is just not good enough. So I think that's, you know, that's really where COP26 is helpful. You see indigenous voices getting centered on occasion in the media in, in, in a situation where they never otherwise would be. And, and obviously people like Greta Thunberg and other radical activists who are kind of speaking out on this. So I think, I think that's really important. And I think that provides a context in which you can also see kind of climate activists being able to make their case to say, you know, we can't wait around for this kind of transformation. But your other point is absolutely spot on. So the idea that essentially for, for corporations, this is really just another, effectively another marketing exercise. It's another way to sell us stuff. It's another way to kind of, um, uh, as you say, greenwash their brand. I think I'm right in saying that the whole kind of um, narrative of like your climate uh, footprint, your carbon footprint was something that's created by maybe BP as a means of basically like individualizing the climate change problem. So, you know, you just turn it into like a problem of, are you in, as an individual recycling enough? Could you fly less, whatever? All of these things are really important. We need to take them seriously. But obviously we, as I say, we look at climate change just as the way, in the same way we look at other issues around, around poverty or racial discrimination, we see it as a structural problem. Like it's, it's baked into the way society is organized. Um, of course, these kind of companies and, and, and multi-millionaire you know, um, business owners are going to tell you that um, we can all club together. You know, I think that's the cl classic thing is it's like, oh, we can all come on. We're all just like a big team. It's like, no, like you guys are a major reason why this is a problem. And you need to change, you know, what you're doing um, if we're going to if we're going to have a serious shot attacking the problem. So when we look back at the Corbyn era, we're going we're, we're to jump back and forth for this, but it goes yeah, without fine. saying that the establishment media and establishment within the Labour machine helped cause the downfall of Jeremy Corbyn and Corbynism. Yet the left aren't without blame, including Jeremy himself. So what would you say that went wrong with Corbyn or Corbynism? And how can we learn from it? Because I, I, I feel at the moment that the left are only united on one issue, and that is anti-Starmer. 
right? Yeah. Great. I mean, we can all have a bit of fun with Sir Keith. But beyond yeah, yeah, yeah. that, it seems the left are at a crossroads. So I suppose it's a two, two-part question. You know, what were the mistakes of Corbynism? And yeah. how do we unify in terms of the context of, you, you know, you're, you're a new political party, there's smaller parties popping up. How can we unify as well? Yeah, I think the point you make about, about the sort of response to Starmer is a really good one. Because I think, funnily enough, I think we're making the same mistake that I just described, actually, of kind of individualizing the problem. So the problem isn't, in a sense, Starmer. Like, we need to get to grips with the idea that Starmer actually just, like, is the Labour Party. Like, he's a personification of what the Labour Party believes in and what it does. And, you know, I, I have quite, you know, an ambiguous views on this in some ways. Like, I think the Labour Party is fundamentally supposed to be a bourgeois middle-class party. Like, that's obviously not what it was founded to do. And the people, you know, the people who created it and the, the sort of the trade unionists, the, the, the working people who created the Labour Party, they, they didn't see it in those terms. But, it, but it's absolutely been, right from the start, by the way, you know, somebody who studies history and the history of, of political movements. And, and yeah, you know, right from the outset, there's a serious effort to co-opt the Labour Party and to make it part of the establishment. And I just, you know, I really see it as a problem ultimately of middle class entitlement. Middle class people just cannot, having two of the three main parties just isn't enough. You know, you've got to have the other one as well. And, and I, I, I sort of, you know, that has, that was the sort of most jarring thing of the last four to five years is kind of, um, it just isn't okay. You know, even just to sort of like have a go, like even for Corbyn, you know, let's just give him a couple of years and see what he does. And like, absolutely not. Like the whole thing has got to be burned down right from the start. It cannot be given a chance. It's quite, I sometimes you will come across people online who'll say things like, well, the problem with Corbyn was, you know, he was too, um, uh, you know, he, he was too much of a sort of narrow leftist. He only really wanted to talk to their fingers. You know, Jeremy Corbyn has the most broadly based shadow cabinet of any Labour leader in recent times, right? The first shadow cabinet here points is broadly based across the Labour Party. Now, why does that stuff just get edited out of the picture? Because the narrative is so strong. So we have this kind of political narrative, which is like leftist bad, leftists kind of um, only, you know, stuck in their own ideological prism, unable to kind of compromise um, and uh, obsessed with ideological purity. It's a great description of most centrist politicians, absolutely obsessed with, this tiny little window of politics that they understand and, and totally rejecting others. You know, the Corbyn project was inherently a compromise. Now, personally, I would say that's OK. You know, some people on the left would say, no, no, that's wrong. You know, that the, the Corbyn, the Corbynite project should have just been much more unambiguously left. No, I think in the context that you were in in 2015, you know, prior to 2015, nobody in the media basically interviewed anyone to the left of Gordon Brown. You know, so in that context, it, it probably made sense that the Corbynite project had to be it had to triangulate to some extent, right? I think it did. I think it, I think it was a triangulation between the kind of things that Corbyn and McDonnell really want to do and believe in and, and what they thought they could basically get through in the, in the political context. And the achievement of the 2017 election campaign, I think, speaks for itself. So in terms of the problem, for me, it's what happens after the 2017 election. Like, that was basically the opportunity, I think, to really try and embed the Labour, the Labour Party and the Labour movement within communities, the, the kind of people who've been inspired by that campaign, they, they needed to be kind of a, a continued effort to, 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 to continue, you know, to, to generate that momentum and maintain that social base. The Labour Party basically, if it's not going to be essentially a commentariat party, which is what everybody who works in the media basically wants it to be, a party that basically does all the kind of things that they think are sensible and which impress them. And they were talking about like 20 people here. But, you know, that, 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 you know, for a certain, for sort of like the Keir Starmers of this world, that's all they care about. So if it was not going to be that, then it needs a kind of a, a broader social base. And I, I don't think that was achieved. Now, the, probably the reason for that was Brexit, that in the end, that just took up too much bandwidth and it just kind of killed uh, any, any other possibilities. But I think that was probably the missed opportunity. So then what does the left do now? Well, the first thing the left does is to realise that, yeah, OK, there was a, it, was a, it was a defeat in 2019. But it isn't some like horrendous disaster in the sense that, I mean, I mean, it is nationally, right? Having Boris Johnson as prime minister is, is obviously a disaster. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, the fact that the left has lost control of the Labour Party is, is, is a disaster in many respects. But um, if you were to compare 2021 with 2001, when I was sort of like becoming an adult or you know, starting to get interested in politics, 
the left is way more prominent in politics now. You know, I'm talking to you on Turn Left Media on, on YouTube. We've obviously got loads of independent left media out there. It's, you, you, it's, it's normal to see genuinely left-wing commentators appearing on, on news shows and discussion shows. And, and the left just won't be quiet. You know, this has basically been the whole thing of the last couple of years is people like Starmer and others saying, just shut up. You know, the grown-ups are back in charge. Just go away. It's like, well, no, actually, because... The, we're not just here because we're kind of fashionable and and you know it's sort of like trendy to be on the left it, it's actually like no there are really fundamental economic reasons why people on the left are committed to their program and so i think we've got to see the opportunity of that and to try and build that movement that the corbyn project wasn't able to build post 2017 and in terms of other parties that's absolutely what we're trying to do we don't view the northern independence party or task or resist as like you know terrible rivals that we need to defeat you know quite the opposite we realize that we're all quite small fish in a in a bigger pond we've got to absolutely try and work together and, and we are um engaged at the moment in that process it's not straightforward but it's it's there's definitely progress being made and and we hope to be able to kind of share that with people sooner rather than later i will touch on about the smaller parties in a second because that's, mm. that's a very important point of working yeah. with smaller parties but uh, I presume with the breakthrough party that you see the Labour Party is unreformable. And I always ask this question with prominent lefties is that the dilemma we have is, do you stay and fight and help reform the Labour Party or yeah. do you occupy a new space? Yeah. I personally think that the left should occupy all political spaces. But yeah. when you do set up a new political party, you are fundamentally saying you must leave the Labour Party and join us. What's your sort of take on it? I'm assuming it is leave the party because Labour, uh, the Labour machine would never allow the left to recapture the Labour Party. But then people said that 20 or 30 years ago, and yet Corbyn yeah. was at the top of uh, the Labour Party. So I would like to know what you think on this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my, my view is that basically the establishment got a massive shock, uh, not in 2015. I think the election of Jeremy Corbyn was not the shock. It, it definitely took people by surprise and it made a few centrist commentators look pretty stupid. But um, they quickly rallied and were like, oh, yeah, well, Labour activists are just stupid and they're, they're obsessed with socialism. And this is going to be hilarious. They're going to get absolutely uh, you know, destroyed at the ballot box. And that'll be like a dose of reality. So the shock was 2017, where it's like, oh, no, you know, a socialist Labour Party leader on a on a social democrat manifesto properly social democratic manifesto not like the kind of um mega triangulation sort of neoliberal politics that we've got used to with labor um in the in the last 30 years prior to 2017 that that polls 40 percent and you can really mobilize people and get them excited in a way that you just can't with kind of like really uh vapid kind of milliband slash star politics um, so that's the shock. And I think for me, that's the starting point for my analysis, which is to say, having had that shock, they're not just going to let you walk back in through the door again. Like th there's going to be a much more sustained and, and quite brutal effort to, to discredit and delegitimize um, the left. And, and you've seen that in the past year. So you're seeing like, you know, the expulsion of, of, of Corbyn from the Labour Party, um, the, uh, or the, at least the attempted expulsion of Corbyn from the Labour Party in the draw of the whip. Um, the and the, the the mass kind of exclusions from the party um, and right down to just like the way that the recent um, protests against the Israeli ambassador were covered. You know, what you see in these things is nobody ever even bothers to interrogate the motives. No one ever sort of says, well, hmm, what are these people saying? Like, what, what do Labour leftists say about uh, about why they're protesting the Israeli ambassador? It's just like, now these are awful people and they need to be driven out of politics. And I think you're just going to see that intensify. And as, as the Starmer project kind of sputters and fails, and I think it will, the polling has, has gone up a little bit because the, the cocktail of Tory disasters is incredibly bad at the moment, but I don't see that lasting. So I think as the kind of Starmer project sputters, there's going to, that isn't going to dial down. You're going to see like a kind of redoubling of efforts because there's a realisation that, you know, that, that Starmer can't necessarily last forever. So I think... Um, that's that's a kind of that's my perspective on it that basically yeah no there's going to be a really really sustained and organized effort in a way that there wasn't really in 2015 to prevent a labor candidate even getting a left candidate story getting on the ballot for labor um so 
So my view is, I, I nuance it a bit. I mean, obviously there's a side to which, of course, I'm going to say like, yeah, everybody listening to this should just leave the Labour Party right now and come and join Brexit, right? That's, only, that's kind of like, you know, and I, there's a side in which like, I guess what I would say to people is just imagine if that happened, right? So, so you know, imagine if we actually did have a party where the where kind of left power was properly concentrated and um, was able to punch its weight. And I think you only have to look at the success of UKIP since what, 20, 2005, to, to realize the power of that. So, so of course, famously, UKIP, UKIP get, I think, one MP, maybe two. Um, they, you know, they don't they don't do well in kind of traditional in electoral sense. But, but what do we actually have right now? We basically have a UKIP government. You know, we basically have the government that UKIP would want. So, so essentially, as a kind of like within first past the post, parties, new parties can't necessarily win masses of seats. But what they can do is exert huge pressure on larger parties, because essentially you can say, well, like, I'm going to take like this fraction of your vote and, you're, you know, you're going to lose without that. So either you either you kind of find a way to work with us or, you know, you can't win. And so I actually do think, you know, if, if people on the on the left really did kind of make a concerted effort um, to support new political projects, I think the, the political impact would be really profound. Um, that being said, you know, as a pragmatist, I, I obviously recognize why some people feel they need to stay in the Labour Party. And I do, I do have some sympathy for the view that it's important that socialists, as you say, are present in different spaces. I have a lot of sympathy and solidarity with colleagues who, comrades who are, who are you know, in, in that fight. And while sometimes for their own mental health, I might advise them to maybe sort of rethink that plan. I, 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 yeah, I, I absolutely have, have solidarity with them, solidarity with Zara Sultana, you know, um, we've got some great MPs. Nadia Whittam is another great example of MP in the in the SCG. Um, you know, I reckon, recognize their position is not straightforward. I see what they're trying to do. But the conclusion I reached a while ago was, yeah, the Labour Party is not reformable. And there's much more scope for doing something radically different as a means of trying to drive through change. The worry that I can see in the future is, yeah, when I look at Keir Starmer and the current direction of the Labour Party, I can't see them winning an election. Obviously, yeah. the context of Scotland. So they, I think when yeah. it, in 2015, when Labour lost Scotland, I essentially predicted there would never be a Labour majority ever again, but yeah. potentially a rainbow coalition and minority government. Yeah. Looking at Keir Starmer, of course, the polls are looking OK for now. But I think you know, the media is probably done with Boris Johnson. I can see Rishi Sunak taking over. Say we come to the next election and Keir Starmer loses. You then yeah. have to wonder which direction the Labour Party goes in. Now, if it goes even further to the right, which it probably would do now, that there seems to be a less of a left-wing resistance. Does that not le delegitimise the left in any way? Obviously, we are always supporting left-wing policies, but yeah, you know, you're seeing interviews right now um, from mainstream commentators saying, "Is you know, I'll be finally kicked out all the fringes of Corbynism." Yeah, there was never, yeah. there was never any. Um, interest from okay so where did Corbynism come from no do we have a point in certain politics it is literally like have we finally kicked them all out yeah these guys and, are just the bad guys right right yeah so you, you, you worry about the left wing discourse as it is today um yeah you know Corbyn was leader only a, a year ago and yet the left has been completely um disgraced in the media so what happens yeah. in the next few years and then the Labour Party ultimately lose another election yeah. Uh, do you see... Oh, and it gets blamed on the left for sure, right? Yeah. I suppose, for sure. yeah, it's, it didn't get rid of Corbynism enough. Uh, totally. That's the, no, that's no, the level of yeah. discord worried about. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I, go when, ahead, when, go. You, when you start saying that, I'm just like, I start to get on my high horse. You know, it's kind of like, you'll literally see the way the commentary at work is literally like, as Labour's polling goes up, they'll be like, oh, they're, they're, they're purging the left more. That's, that's really working. And then if it starts going down, they'll be like, oh, no. They didn't purge the left enough. Oh dear, they've got to they've got to do that more. And so they just literally they'll just change that depending on where the where the line is in terms of Labour's polling. So like low polling means you didn't purge the left enough. That's mm. literally that's the that's the kind of the level of analysis we're talking about. So, so I, I totally get your question, and, and this would be my response. Um, we're not asking. So at the level where I think we're staying in the Labour Party, I think what we're doing is we're saying come on guys, please just be nice to us. Like, like we're not that bad. Like, you know, come on, just like give us a bit of space, you know, you know, see what we can do. 
Whereas I feel like if we're organized in a, in, in a new, I'm not going to say a party, but a new political movement, I'm not, I, as I'm, I'm saying in this call, you know, absolutely join Tusk, join, uh, join the NIP, join Breakthrough, whichever party, you know, you see is the one that speaks um, closest to you or, or speaks to your values. Um, but as a movement outside the Labour Party, we're not saying kind of please be nice to us. We're saying, no, 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 we're here and we're organized. And if you don't work with us, you can't win because we're going to take a, a fraction of your core vote. And so I think for me, it's that now, you know, we're not there yet on that, in, on that, so, you know, um, in our kind of current organization. We, we, we need to push harder to achieve that. But for me, it's a question of, if we're staying in the Labour Party, then we're, we're asking the establishment to make some room for us, and they're not going to do that. So for me, you need an organisation that means that you're not asking anymore. You alluded to UKIP earlier on, and that you can, because I, I do agree in a sense that if you were to confine yourself just to the Labour Party, then the Labour Party can treat you however you want. Your vote yeah. is guaranteed. Um, and I think it is important, especially in a democratic society, to show that there is pressure there to respond to the outside political forces to you know maybe nudge uh, adopt a left-wing policy here or there i understand that and then yeah. you sort of use ukip as an example that you know political representation isn't big they never want a seat but we've got brexit we've got a very right-wing government and whilst i do think the left should always strive i mean i've always called for like sort of a left-wing ukip it's a bit antagonistic but essentially be that pressure but on the flip side of that is it was despite you could have no political representation in terms of parliament it was very easy for them to do that in a way that because it, it very much fits the establishment their policies are very yeah. pro-establishment they then breaking through in the political narrative is much more acceptable to the establishment than in a sort of left-wing party or left-wing pressure group so i think they would double yeah. down even harder and that you find less success than going the sort of UKIP route. But having said that the alternative is within the Labour Party. Now, I do want to talk about more about Breakthrough Party itself. Yeah. Um, you've had two candidates who have defected from the Labour Party. So that's pretty big news, right? For, for us, it's, it's huge. You know, we, 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 we recognise, you know, a lot of people who kind of um, want to play this down will say, we well, obviously, you know, there's, there's lots and lots of councillors and, you know, yeah, you know, this, this, you've got a long way to go, basically. But I think what it does is to show people that there is this demand. There is this demand for something else. There are, there are, there are people who are, who are really great people, right, representing their local communities um, who want to enact profound change in those communities and just don't feel that they can do so as part of the Labour Party because they just don't see it as like um, one that is consistent with the kind of changes that they want to see and they want to push through. So I think for us, it's really, really important on a symbolic level of saying um, the people who have got their, their community's interests at heart are increasingly finding themselves unable to carry out their roles within the Labour Party. And yeah, we, we, we are obviously on the, on the verge of announcing more of these, more of these defections. So we're going to have another one coming out tomorrow. I'm not going to say who or where, but it's but but look out for it online. And we and we're talking to lots of other Labour councillors, um, elected um, Labour politicians around the country, um, and they want to talk to us. Um, and uh, we we basically think each time this happens, it's a reminder to people that there's an alternative out there, and that um, you know that's what people are desperately looking for that you know we do a lot of like um we, we have a lot of discussions with people particularly on twitter so like we, we, that's one area where we are active uh, kind of online and we do therefore kind of reach out to people and have discussions in, in dms and stuff like that and just i just can't tell you how many conversations i have which is like i'm just like desperately looking for an alternative i'm desperately looking for something that represents my politics and my values and you know, that, that real need, it's a real kind of deep psychological need that people have to just like see a party that genuinely speaks for them and represents them. And they don't have to feel like they have to really, really hold their nose to get behind it. Um, and I think, you know, you're, the, the people who've already made that jump, I think are incredibly brave because they've, they've put their heads above the parapet. I think it's going to get easier for people to do it as time goes on, particularly as the, the kind of the extent of the failure of the Labour Party becomes more and more obvious. So I think, yeah, you're going to see more of this happen. And um, 
yeah, it, I think it sends a message to the establishment that um, people aren't willing to just wait around for the Labour Party to suddenly decide that it might take an interest in their lives. Um, and we, we are absolutely all about organising within local communities. So for us, these defections are really important. So what would you say your current structure is with Breakthrough? I know you, I believe you're having a, uh, is it a leadership election uh, sometime this uh, next year, or how is so, your structure, yeah. because you are a new political party? Yeah, so we're currently um, about to embark, I think we have embarked on the elections for the NEC. So we, we you know, in that respect, similar to Labour, we have a, you know, a, a, a national executive um, at the core, we have a constitution, which you can look up online. Um, and we, we do have an elected leader and deputy leader that's already gone through. Um, and then those elections will then take place on like a regular basis kind of going forward. So um, it's, it's really worth looking up um, our leader and deputy. So Alex Mays is our leader. Um, Alex is a working class guy. Um, he's, um, you know, I think early 30s. Um, I haven't asked him actually, but I think so. Um, he He's someone who... Um, is, is just has this real drive to kind of to, to change stuff. Alex is great because he's, if you meet him, he's just a really, really pragmatic kind of, you know, he's not a, I don't know, he's not interested in building a cult of personality or kind of like, you know, some like monument to his greatness. This is very much just about, he's seen a, a, a real problem in the way politics works. And he's just like, well, I want to change it. And he, he you know, he put a huge amount of time and effort to, to, to launch the party. And as a result, you know, when that first leadership election happened, I think I'm right in saying Alex was the only candidate and he was, you know, he was, you know, widely approved by the membership. Now, obviously we want to get to a point where we've got multiple candidates for the leadership and we're, you know, that, that kind of process will happen. But, you know, as you say, we're, we're very new at the moment. Um, Sherilyn Wildman is our deputy leader, again, elected. Again, Sherry's a, a, a young working class woman. Um, she, you know, she, she works uh, in, in, in the retail sector. She has a job that is precarious. She can really talk about, articulate the, the challenges that young working class people face in the, in the works in the sector of, 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 of retail, in, in her housing situation. So, you know, we have people who are kind of like, this is their daily experience, their lived experience. Um, and um, that's, you know, the, the kind of people that I hope we're going to see elected to the NEC uh, in terms of the candidates that are putting, putting themselves forward. That's what we're going to see. So um, that's our model. Um, it's, uh, you know, we have we do a lot, as you can imagine, online um, at the moment. Obviously, that's pretty much essential. So we have uh, a Discord uh, platform that we use for policy discussions. We have regular meetings on Zoom for policy. And then our membership, our membership who are participating in those, and that's going to eventually build our manifesto. At the moment, we have our 10 policy priorities, which you can look up online, but we're looking to build that out and to have a full manifesto um, as soon as we can. We're just developing it sort of steadily because obviously we don't want to rush it and have stuff that actually doesn't stand up to scrutiny. So, yeah, look at your policy proposals. You know, they are very, to me, quite moderate social democratic policies. Many parties share them. Was it £15 minimum yeah. wage? You've got uh, high taxes on the rich, abolishing tuition fees. Obviously, a lot of that was adopted in the Labour Party, but we could pretty much say goodbye to them policies, if you ask yeah. me. Now, I know obviously a new political party, but have you also sort of talked about post-capitalist policies? You, you describe yourself as a democratic socialist party. And even seeing political parties across the world who call themselves the Communist Party, you go on their website, you look up their manifestos, and mostly are just social democratic parties or to policies, excuse me. So yeah, yeah, yeah. do you have any sort of analysis of post-capitalist policies as well sprinkled in there? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I mean, first of all, like you're, you're right, yeah, that, um, you know, there's an element where this, this, this does reflect a kind of, you know, social democratic agenda. And the reason for that is obviously because, um, you know, it, it, you are trying to, you've, you've obviously got to get the vehicle from A to B. And like, you know, you are starting from this place of sort of, you know, as I say, four decades of neoliberalism. And so there is a sense of like, okay, well, like here are some just basic things that we need. Like <laughs> we're gonna, we want to work towards a different kind of economic model, but like, yeah, just at a basic level, people need to be paid so they can like live. You know, they're not, they're not basically just, um, yeah, just uh, just dependent on, on, on social support or charity or food banks or whatever to just to, just to make ends meet and keep a roof over their heads. So I think there's a sort of an emergency level to that. We need like some kind of, of, of control on rent. That's one of our 10 um, priorities, for example. I think what we see like in terms of like remodeling, certainly the UK, 
is to is to be thinking in terms first of all of a much more federalized um country so we 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 look, we look at sort of progressive federalism as a model. So we, we really decentralise the country fully. We you know rather than having this country that's totally centred around Westminster, but devolving powers to nations and regions, and really to the extent you know that um, obviously with we 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 absolutely are very kind of sensitive to different parts of the UK that actually want their own independence, but but also just um, a much greater concentration of power within local areas. Policies like community wealth building, I think, are really, really important to that so that we have, you know, at the moment we have an economy where essentially like things like austerity, uh, the financialization of the economy, these things are like baked in and they're like they're fundamental to the model. And so the, the, the model is predicated on the idea of of actually starving communities of support so that they're, they are precarious. Like that's, you know, like the precarity that people experience isn't some unfortunate byproduct of capitalism, like it, it's how it works. Um, if you if you maintain that precarity, then then people have to keep um, doing these low paid jobs, etc. So we we believe in a model um, which actually ensures that you know the the wealth that's generated within communities is reinvested in those communities. Um, and I think that that for us offers a kind of a real alternative way of seeing how our country could run. And also in terms of like democratizing your workplace, for example, you know that's just again like something that's just totally anathema, you know, uh, to most people. The idea that you might actually have some kind of control over your workplace and you're not just basically at the mercy of your of your boss um i i think i think for me those would be two kind of simple ways in which we could actually re envisage a completely different way of organizing society so because you're a youth-led movement as you've described that essentially brings me on to the housing crisis um yeah. you know the the housing situation for us young people is is appalling what would you say the state of the housing system is at the moment? What ideas has Breakthrough got to bring to the table? You know, would you abolish landlords, for example? Yeah, so, I mean, I think a lot of our politics kind of starts in housing. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's just, a, I think if you're trying to sort of see the just like the total irrationality of the system, I think housing is the best way to do it. Because it's just like, I don't know, it's as if like 30 years ago we said, okay, if you own a house and then you keep it, here's like, I don't know, 300 grand. You know, I'm plucking a number out of the air there, but it's as if we just went, congratulations, like you won the lottery, like well done, like here, like here, like you're, you know, you're basically set up. You've got this incredibly valuable asset um, and, um, you know, that, that can see you through. Oh, except by the way, if you get a really debilitating illness, in which case you're going to have to sell it to pay for your care. But I mean, you know, nevertheless, you've got this, you know, really valuable asset. Whereas if you just didn't, if you just became an adult later, that's it. Like, you you know, no, I'm afraid, you, you know, it's, you're going to have to live in this much more precarious situation where your housing is, is costing you way more than half of what you earn. Um, and, uh, and your prospects of owning a house and gaining some security are really limited. So I think, yeah, like the, the starting point is to say, like, just what is a house for? Like, what's this idea that a house is an economic asset that you can use to enrich yourself you know all these videos you see of landlords kind of you know enthusiastically telling people about how how many different hmos they've managed to convert in the past 10 years and how many thousands of pounds it's made it's like that should create more cognitive dissonance in people like that should create more of a sense of like what the hell is going on like you're talking about people's ability to just live comfortably and actually this, you know, people's, people's living conditions are being turned into like leveraging maximum profit and, 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 you know, housing situations that are potentially really bad, you know, what's the priority? It's to leverage as much profit and therefore to, you know, minimal kind of like renovations to the property, charge the, 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 the tenant as much as possible, et cetera. So yeah, for us, it's just like, we need a different model. We need a model where houses are, for, are to provide people with homes to live in and to, and to bring up their children or you know to, to fulfill themselves in whatever way they want to um so i mean you know we as i say in terms of policy we're working out the details of it at the moment we have a policy about um, about rent controls which is really important but i think yeah i think more generally we would see it as like transitioning to an economy where you know like renting off the state would be more of the norm and so you would have much more extensive um public housing uh you would you you I, I think ban landlords i'd certainly ban uh 
Van Lordism. So I, I think there is a distinction between like, I don't know, so I don't, you know, you, you can Im- you can imagine situations of, of like renting a property that are less kind of obviously destructive. But I think situations where people like people's literal literal job is to be a landlord is that shouldn't be possible in the way society is organized. Um, so, it, you know, that as an organizing principle, just transforming the idea that 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 housing isn't something that is a, is, a, is an economic asset. It's a social good. Is, is really fundamental. I do think there is a huge political space when it comes to the housing crisis. And I don't think that uh, any left-wing movements before I've really articulated how bad the crisis is. I was yeah. quite disappointed that even with Corbynism, there was yeah. obviously great policies in there such as rent control, but I don't think they, they expanded so much of the issues at stake with housing obviously yeah. the cost of housing and then you've got so we mentioned about landlordism and then also the future what would that look like of you know is it, is it a renting from the state because what i sort of got from the left was just moving into this sort of social democratic just own your own home which is i don't yeah. really have a problem with because when we talk about work and ownership we like to have pride in our work and that's where we talk about look at the works of marx you talk about ownership of work that's what make people more proud and work better and harder and that home ownership is probably one of them things. So I understand the social democratic argument, but there was no real vision I felt when it came to housing. And I think we do need more of these conversations. Obviously, rent controls are fantastic policies, but I think we need to go beyond that. What we're yeah. seeing in Berlin, these sorts of discussions, I think we really, really need to push forward with. And I think that's a, uh, should I say, it's a, a great opportunity for the left which the political right haven't picked up on. They've used, obviously, immigration and they've yeah. used democratic rights quite effectively, but they haven't talked about housing. You've, you've got a fundamental problem which the Labour Party faces, which the, a, 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 there's a chunk of its voting base who were essentially, you know, were enriched by the property boom of the 80s and 90s. So you've got, so, you know, the, people talk about the Red War and they use it in this really lazy way. You know, they sort of talk about, like, all these Red War voters and they're just like, I don't know, racists or they're kind of like, they don't like Labour because Labour's too soft on, on immigration or it's too soft on crime or whatever. You know, the simple reality is if you're over 50 and, you know, you might be a traditional Labour voter, you might be, you might have, you know, worked in an, in, in an industry which is regarded as like traditionally working class. But if you, if you were able to buy a house, you know, relatively cheaply in the 1780s, then you've got a really valuable asset. And I think, you know, that, that that's, when we take when we sort of take a Marxist analysis, mm. then obviously those people are not really necessarily kind of like classically or traditionally working class anymore. They have a certain like um, cultural affiliation, if you like, or a, a certain sense of social identity that might be working class. But actually, their living circumstances are really different. Labour Party is a really broad coalition. You know, I, as I say, I understand why the Corbynite project felt like it couldn't tackle those kind of vested interests. Um, and it's particularly difficult when, as you say, the media just won't articulate these problems. You know, not it's not that it won't, it's not that it's biased in the debate. I think that's important to remember. The debate doesn't happen. You know, it's not like they have the debates, but then they then they skew it. It's like, no, no, there's no debate around the around issues around like the effect of of like landlordism and 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 having houses as 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 economic assets and the, the kind of the property bubble and the effect that that has. Um, socially there's a kind of like hand wringing of like oh it's really bad that young people can't buy a house so the solution is like we'll do all this market-based stuff like you know we'll just basically inflate the bubble even more by offering cheap credit and stuff like that it's like no no like you're just you're just fueling this addiction and it's going to keep driving um, prices up and make it even harder for the next generation Mm. so i think you know there is a structural problem it's really difficult because the press don't want to talk about it that's why my view is you've got to be this insurgent force. You've just got to basically make people talk about it. Well, you said about the Labour Party is a broad coalition. And that's where, you know, this is a good analysis of why they didn't probably go so hard in terms of the housing situation, because, like you said, traditional Labour voters now own a home. And that then gets onto the broad issue with the left. So I think there has been a sort of middle class activism that has been associated with left movements it's not to say it's true but that is what we are seeing like and we do have a lot of 
support from the metropolitan students, big cities. This is fantastic because obviously the coalition with the left has changed over time. The problem that poses though, is if we want to grow a mass movement, how do we get out of just the sort of left-wing metropolitan space and, and broaden that to more traditional places? I, I hate to use the term red wall, but obviously how yeah, do you yeah. expand on that? And the Labour Party is in a unique position where even though it's sort of losing that, it can still bring that together. If we're an outside force, if we're a new political party, a new political movement, the whole yeah. debate about, around protesting has gone south. You know, we've got the issues of exile and insulate Britain, and that's all left movements are seen now. So how, how do we transform this into a popular movement without the Labour brand? Look, I think it's really important to stress, isn't it? These are just, these are difficult things either way. So, so it's like, I, I would definitely acknowledge we've got challenges, but then there's massive challenges if you're still in the Labour Party of doing that. So the first thing that I think I would want to say is that, is that it's really important that we remember that if, if we say, yeah, our base is like, say, you know, our, the, left, the, the left is most powerful in, in as you say, metropolitan areas, um, particularly young people um, who, might, who might have been students or, you know, whatever. We, we're talking about working class people. I think I think there's a problem that we have in our discourse. Obviously, not saying what you're saying, but the, the general discourse is like if you say to somebody who are working class people, that their automatic response is like a middle aged white guy living in Hartlepool, and it's like, well, that person probably owns their own house, and they've probably retired on a decent pension, or they're going to retire on a decent pension. So I'm not saying you know. They're and there might be you know, obviously real people live in very different ways but as a sort of generalization whereas if we're talking about a young person who you know has studied philosophy at university or whatever then they're, and they're probably like they're working in a cafe because there isn't a, a a job available in a, in a kind of industry that they're trying to work in or break into they're probably paying way more than half of their income in rent um they might be, if they're in a city therefore the rents are likely to be much higher um and um, yeah, they're kind of like access to social support is potentially really difficult because the services in their local area are under loads of pressure. So I just think it's important to remember that, you know, if we, if we believe in the idea of like working class social organization, then, then yeah, we absolutely should be organizing in these places. And these places are also, they're gonna be way more ethnically diverse. You know, the, the, the kind of like my, the, the, the classic sort of um, newspaper racialization of the working class. So the working class is like a white, it's always like the white working class and and it's sort of like well, a well what does that even mean but also b uh, it, it's almost as if what you're saying is well yeah minorities don't really count as working class in some way so i think you know yeah we, 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 there's a reason why the left is successful in these areas and again it's not just because left ideas are trendy you know i was i was a student at university not lot, lot long ago sort of like in 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 the, the late kind of 2000s and 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 let me tell you, left wing ideas were not that popular. Yeah, okay, maybe a few of sort of radical fringe students were in, in goal, in, involved in organising. Most students were totally apathetic. There's a reason why student politics has become much more left wing in the last ten to fifteen years. And it's not because of woke culture and safe spaces. It's because young people face a really different economic and social reality. Um, so I just, I, I mean, that's my starting point because it's just like, yeah, we, we we should really be positive about the idea that this is th th there's a real coalition to build um, amongst these voters. But of course, I totally agree with you. The, the, the left movement has to be much broader than that. Um, I, you know, to me, the only the, the only solution is you, you you talk relentlessly about the real concerns people face and you show solidarity with people. So so for example, where you have striking workers. In, in a whole range of industries. I'm thinking about like, we had strikes recently from, you know, Weetabix, you see strikes, um, you know, we've seen um, McDonald's or, and then you've got like young Pizza Express workers or, you know, you, you need, the solidarity needs to be that we, we, we are like turning up for and advocating for all of those different workers and the conditions that they're in. Uh, and and that you know if it's fire and rehire or whatever tactics, and we kind of identify the idea that there is this common solidarity that 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 people ordinary workers um, share, regardless of their age or their or their social backgrounds, etc. Um, now that isn't easy because there's a relentless campaign of divide and rule in in the media and from senior politicians, which is like constantly trying to tell people 
you know, you're not like them. You're different. You're kind of like, you've got something to lose. These, there's some people coming to try and take what you've got away from you. And that's, again, it, I just, it, whether you're in the Labour Party or not, like that is a relentless challenge. Um, but I feel like the difference is that we outside of the Labour Party can at least try to articulate those um, that that kind of agenda of solidarity. Whereas, you know, at the moment, the current direction of the Labour Party is to just completely cave in. And it's to be, you know, I think there's nothing more kind of like awful to watch than this kind of like, you know, the, from the Lisa Nandys and, and whatever of this world going out on the media and basically saying like, we're just so sorry. We're so sorry that we kind of, we did all that stuff. Like, you know, we're really, really embarrassed that we kind of, we kind of dare to offer any kind of different vision for, for society, but don't worry, we're not going to do that anymore. And, um, you know, we, we, we're just going to do the kind of things that, you know, we're supposed to do. And that, you know, they're more or less, you know, it's sort of like telegraphing that message constantly. So I think, yeah, you know, it's not straightforward, but it has to be, um, it has to be through solidarity. And that means for us, it's like, we, we want to become as big a movement as possible so that we can, we can embody that. So before we wrap this up, we obviously identified a lot of the political terrain we're currently in. We've identified the crises we face. What message do you have of hope of the left right now? Because clearly the, the fall of Corbyn um, yeah. and movements around the world, the fall of the left, we are essentially a bit of a crossroads. So I would like to hear from you where you see we can, you know, you've identified where we have advantages, but do you have a message of hope strategy for the left going forward well let me start with i mean okay i'll start with strategy and i'll try and finish with hope right so strategy is yeah we've got you know we know what the strategy is we've got to organize um, we've got to build links we've got to be prepared to work with um groups on the left who we, where we don't agree about every single thing so we've got to be prepared to 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 not 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 compromise really really important values. That's that's important to say. But but you know to recognise that, that the left is a is a broad coalition even outside the Labour Party, and we need to kind of build that solidarity and and and, and work together on as much as we possibly can. Um, and and um, we need to organise this growing left wing kind of um, movement within society and galvanize it and politicize it and like focus it on the enemies that it actually faces you know and sort of like like political education is really really important in terms of like our strategy of like pointing to like you know this is what's creating that problem you know and sort of so so that people really understand what it is they're up against so i think those like those would be the two things i would say organization and political education but like in terms of a message of hope yeah i mean like i i um I, I study history. Um, I think it's really, you know, helpful subject to kind of um, get your head around a lot of what's happening at the moment for obvious reasons. And I think the, the one lesson I take from history is actually people will often say things like, oh, history repeats itself. The one lesson I take from history is like the opposite of that. It's basically like unexpected stuff happens in history a lot, you know, so like to like almost anything you can think of, which is a major transformation in history politically, people have been saying for the previous 10 years, that can't happen. Like this is the politics works like this. And, you know, sensible people like this get power and they do these kinds of things. And, and those things are always true until they're not true anymore. And then suddenly when they're not true, everybody's like, oh yeah, of course, like that was inevitably going to happen. But until it happens, nobody can see it. So I think, you, you know, as, as difficult and challenging as it might look, you just don't know what, where the next kind of turning point is coming. And, and you know, in terms of like right now, I just see a massive paradigm shift happening within society. Um, you know, obviously the, the kind of long-term fallout from the economic crisis uh, at the late 2000s, the 2008 onwards. Um, then, of course, um, the kind of like the, the sort of the fallout from, from, from Brexit within the UK and other debates. And now with the pandemic, we've, we've really had, and, and by the way, also the and climate change, you, there, there are these things that are happening which create massive crises in the kind of intellectual framework of neoliberalism and you know it actually can't really survive in in the form that it's existed up to now so so fundamental changes have to happen and i think um there'll always be people telling you that it can't be done and you might as well just give up and i think you know if every movement that had achieved radical change had done that then we wouldn't have got the kind of positive changes that have happened in society over the past 
decades and whatever. So that would be my message of hope. Like, we've, you know, if if we if we do the kind of organisation and the political education that we need to do, then we can, if I can say it, we can break through. Uh, yeah. Joe, what an excellent conversation. Um, I'm so happy you came on. We'll have to have you on again for more discussions. Um, but I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, thanks, Curtis. Great to talk to you.